Practice is everything. I don't have time for it to be everything. This is just a hobby. What do you mean it's everything? Oh, well, that one makes sense. Woodworking is a lifelong learning endeavor. This hobby drives us to constantly want to try new stuff, learn, and get better. Unfortunately, learning and gaining skill does not occur through osmosis. Reading books and viewing podcasts will not make us a better woodworkers. Just like armchair quarterbacking doesn't make you a better football player. You've got to get out there and do it. Practicing an activity over and over with the goal each time of doing it better is the best way to learn. And practicing the basics well first so that its execution is second nature is the best way to create a strong foundation to build upon. Yeesh. Woodworking all of a sudden sounding a lot like a sport. Anyways, I'm trying to learn to turn. And one of the foundation tools of turning is the ever so dreaded skew chisel. So figuring I'd learn one tool at a time, the skew was the first up. Unfortunately, I hate repetitive practicing. It gets boring. And in turning, practicing means you just end up with shavings on the floor. I always prefer to jump into a project so I have a tangible reward at the end. So the trick for me in making practice fun is to pick small projects that will exercise a certain skill. In order to learn to use a skew effectively, I'm choosing to make a couple sets of screwdrivers by only using the skew. The reason why I'm choosing this screwdriver project is because it's cheap. It's fairly quick to do, and making tool handles is something I'll be doing my entire life as a woodworker, and it forces me to use all the cuts that skew chisel can do, such as planing so I can smooth it and taper it, peeling cuts so I can just rapidly remove material, scraping cuts to help smooth it and to shape certain aspects, and slicing cuts such as making V-cuts and beads for the ends. So this will be the perfect project for me to learn the skew. There are really a large variety of skew chisels out there, and unfortunately the information on which one to invest your money and time learning is just discombobulating. The variables are in the size of it, the length of it, the width, its shape, bevel angle, and even bevel shape. I recently went to SWAT, which is the Southwest Area Turners Association's yearly symposium, and listened to three major experts who use a skew almost exclusively. It didn't help. Alan Lancer prefers a monstrous sized skew with the sides of it that are kind of rounded uh, so that it's easier to move along his uh, rest. He uses it for everything from microscopic turnings to massive spindles. The reason he stated was that the mass adds control, it's a little bit less flexible for vibration, and the flat allows for a lot more variety of cuts and then he has a varying bevel to provide more flexibility. Now the reason why he the bevel on his skew was half straight, almost like a scraping, and then half curve, was he said he could, by having that half straight in it, he can approach shearing cuts straight on, almost like using it like a massive parting tool to just really waste away work. And then since you never really use the top half whenever you're making slice cups because of physics, you always use the bottom half, that's where the sweet spot is, he put the curve on it to increase the space on that. So he basically increases the size of this chisel without increasing the width. And it works for him. After that one, I went to Nick C Cook. And he absolutely hates overly large uh, skews. In fact, he prefers the oval skew that Alan Lancer just despises because he says it allows for easier rolling for all the cuts that he does. And finally, there was Robert Rosand. He used a, almost a microscopic skew. Anyways, it just drove me nuts because none of them gave me the exact direction I needed to go. They were all different. As you can see over the years, I've bought all different styles of these skews. I really did want to learn to do them right. I finally ended up on preferring a flat straight beveled three-quarter inch skew for one simple reason. It was the only one I can reliably get sharp. 
and a sharper tool is your best tool. You can see in the pictures that I really sucked at sharpening the oval one because there isn't a place to really rest it. It being oval, it wants to roll around on you. And that made it extremely hard to do scraping cuts on the lathe because of the different pressure on different sides twisted off in your hand. Plus the fact that it's got a really high angle. So you had to approach the scraping cuts extreme angle. So it kind of exasperated your leverage. I just, I truly hated it. I've also bought, took a straight skew and put a curve on it. And actually this worked really well for me. The only problem was that I couldn't get it really sharp. Not the sharp that I'm used to with my hand tools and hand chisels. Uh, basically, the only way I could figure out how to do it was to curve it on the grinder and take that straight to the lathe. And it just, it dulled quick. It was just never a perfect cut, and I always had to sand after it. I also bought a really tiny skew, thinking that that's what you would use for tiny work like pens. Bad mistake. Tiny skew means tiny sweet spot. Remember, you only use the bottom half of the, of the straight edge when you're making slicing cuts. Uh, something about physics and the angle you're doing it otherwise it wants to move around on you so i ended up with this straight three-quarter size screw uh, chisel it has a nice long sweet spot and sharpening is extremely easy i put a hollow grind on it I take it over to my stones and go through diminishing grits pulling on it then head back to the lathe and every now and then while i'm on the lathe i just use a little diamond hone to touch it up it stays sharp a long time this way and my cuts are really smooth. The other tools and materials I use in this project, most average turners will already have. The materials are just a chunk of wood, a little wider than you want your screwdriver handle to be, and about a third longer if you're going to be working between centers. I use some soft maple, beech, and walnut that I had left over to designate between Phillips square and the normal slotted screwdrivers. I also picked up a couple full sets of screwdriver shanks from Lee Valley. These are the same shanks that are on their lifetime screwdrivers. They're incredibly inexpensive and I have a tip coated to reduce slippage. They also have some wings on the side so that you can drive them in with a friction fit and they won't slip or come out. I also picked up some correctly sized brad point bits and some brass ferrules. Now let me tell you, after I was done, I wish I'd just cut up some copper pipe for the ferrules. I thought these would look cool because the ends are rounded over, but I found them so thin that they deformed when I pounded them on. With the thicker brass, you can actually sand down the end so it gets really sharp, and when you drive it onto the, onto the tenon, it will actually shave the sides to become a perfect fit. But the brass did polish up nicely. On the lathe, I use a drive center, a live center, and a Jorgensen chuck for drilling. The live center I chose was actually smaller than the diameter of the ferrule. That way I could turn the tenon, install the ferrule so it gained some strength, and then drill a hole, and then put the live center into that hole to center it if I wanted to. Otherwise, you could just drill the hole at the end. And in setting up the brad point bit, I wrapped some blue tape at the depth that would allow the screwdriver shank wings to fully seat within the ferrule. Now for measuring the size of the ferrule, I use some dial calipers to get close. If you had them, vernier calipers would be so much better. Otherwise, just wing it. It doesn't really matter. Finally, I'm using my little jet mini lathe. It's a pipsqueak of a lathe, but you can always hear it saying, I think I can, I think I can, I think I can. It tries. It works. That's all that can be said about it. So let's start turning. Now before any practice, you got to warm up. So starting off, we got to do a quick some calisthenics. I got some construction grade lumber right here, just cheap pine. I cut it in squares and I'm setting the center by just lining up the two corners. Go ahead and mount it on your lathe. Be sure once you got the tailstock up tight, you check that your uh, tool rest is the proper distance by turning it by hand. Do not turn it on until it is set and locked. And then you want to check the sharpness of your tools. Uh, I typically would do that by just scraping, planing on the corners all the way across the blade to make sure that everything cuts. And now we're ready to go. 
we're about to turn do all the cuts that we normally do in this project. Uh, first is the roughing cut, and you just come out over one inch at a time and cut back in, and then come all the way across to take off the ridges. Uh, that's the easiest way I know to rough with the skew chisel. And as long as you don't have a big object, roughing out with a skew is perfectly fine. In fact, it's it's great because if it catches, it's going to release because half the time, a quarter of the time, you're only turning the wood the rest of the time you are turning air so it'll release into the air it's a great way to learn also if you want to check the smoothness just rest your tool right on top now on the last planing cut you're going to smooth it out this is where you practice your skill notice i've got the blade at 45 degrees and the shavings are coming off the lower half of the blade that's the stabless portion of it it is riding on the bevel i'm using the bevel to keep it straight and you just smoothly go across and result is because of that 45 degrees it's just like a 45 degree on a hand plane soft soft wood it cuts smoothly i had a little bit of rough spot so i can actually reverse the plane and do it at the same rate now if you increase that 45 degrees it's kind of like working on hardwoods uh, with hand planes. Uh, highly figure wood, uh, increase angle, we'll smooth it out. Now we're going to start practicing our cuts. The first one I'm going to do is a V-cut. Notice I start way above it and come down until the point hits, and then I go into arch in towards the center. Uh, once you make that initial V, you come in on the sides. I'm using the side of the edge as my bevel. So I have two bevels on the left side and the right side. So first I create a V, and then I ride the side bevels into the bottom. With a V-cut, though, you can't go too far, because once you get past the bevels, it, it's, you're just basically pressing in. This is what's called a slicing cut, because I'm actually slicing across grain uh, into the wood. I'm slicing the wood off. Now notice when I'm go going, running, rubbing the bevel, the back of my blade is actually rotating over a little bit. What's strange is the closer you get to a catch, the smoother the cut will be. If you just keep it straight up and down, it's not going to catch because the blade's not going to ride up. But it's that's just how it is with turning. The closer to the disaster, the better the results. Here I'm starting to do my beads. Now this time I'm riding the bevel, but the only part that's touching is the very toe of my skew and I'm riding it around. Now I'm making a mistake here. Notice that I'm pivoting on the tool rest. I really should not be doing that. You're supposed to slide and keep that skew at 90 degrees and because I pivoted like that you look that one particular bead is kind of pointy and flat. Uh, it's a bad bead. Here I'm doing a little bit better job of sliding on the tool rest keeping it at 90 degrees and just rotating it around. That's the way you use cove. Now, just like when you are making a V cut, the closer to disaster, the closer you get to having a cut, the smoother the cut will be. But don't worry about being too perfect because you can always sand it smooth. Next up, I'm going to do a shearing cut. And this is the way you rapidly remove material. I start up high and then I bring the tool down until it starts to cut. And then I push in at an arc. Notice my hand raises up and it pushes forward. That keeps the bevel on the wood. If you don't have the bevel on the wood, it will catch and flip around, which isn't good. Now, just like on the V cut, I'm going to do a slicing cut. This time, I'm riding the bevel so it is 90 degrees so I can shear a nice, smooth face. I can also do the same thing coming into it to undercut it a little bit. You can also use a shear cut to do that now this time i don't know if you notice this but i'm pushing in at angle i'm using the tools uh, side to push in at 45 degrees to get a undercut with a shear cut so you can do it with a v cut and there otherwise now if you notice that the bevel is pretty much at 90 degrees to the tool rest this is called a scraping cut and basically i'm not cutting in i'm I'm just letting the wood slightly shear off the edge. I will tell you this, that cut right there, scraping cuts, really do dull your tools. This is another way of doing beads with a planing cut. 
the wood is actually coming off slightly below center. Now that is probably the scariest cut I know of because that's the easiest way to get a catch. Either the tip or the toe touches and it's going to jerk around on you. It's not dangerous or anything, it's just kind of spooky. Now as you get closer, you can transition into the flat. And this is how you can make a cove cut with a skew. You transition in. The difference is instead of cutting on the lower half, you're going to start cutting on the upper half. That way there's less tool so you can have a quick, easier pivot point. Uh, there, uh, it's less thick there so you can rotate it around. As long as you keep the bevel riding, it's somewhat safe. Now one thing with this is you can never go uphill. Notice I'm having to reverse to come from the other side. I'm going downhill to make the cove cut. So there we go. Quick practice for the rough cut, the planing cut, the veed cut, the veeding, cutting a curve with a planing cut, a cove with a planing cut, and slicing for end grain. The first thing we need to do is make our square blank round, and that involves the roughing cut with a skew. You want to touch the bevel to the wood first, and because it's square, it is going to make a chattering sound. Then slowly raise the back of your uh, skew handle up until the edge engages. Then working your way across about an inch at a time, make slight scooping cuts. Remember, as you get towards the end edge, you never want to plane onto an edge. You always want to plane off an edge. You'll prevent any kind of catchings. When you've made your rough cuts all the way across, then make one smooth planing cut all the way down. Now you're probably going to not make it round the first time out. You'll have to do the roughing cuts and the planting cut across a couple times, but eventually it will get round. It typically took me two or three times to do that. So just rinse and repeat until you get a smooth finish. Now, because the, the stock was so much thicker at the very beginning, you're going to need to readjust your tool rest. Next, we're going to be making the tenon. So the first thing I did was I did a rough measurement of how thick the tenon is. I just use a pencil, uh, set it up, and then turn the lathe on. It'll make a nice, smooth, straight line all the way across. Don't worry about being too accurate with this because more than likely you're going to screw it up a few times as you're practicing. Uh, but it gives you a rough idea. Now we're going to shear cut the tenon. Notice I purposely and forcefully touch the tool rest first. This is a mental cue for me that I am always resting the tool on the tool rest. Then I start up real high and I will touch the bevel down first. Actually below the bevel first and then I'll come down to the bevel. And then by slowly raising the back of the handle up, I wait for it, the edge to engage. Once it, the edge starts engaging and cutting, I do a sweeping motion and I raise the back of the handle up and move the tool forward so that the edge makes an arc towards the center line of the block. This way that the bevel continually rides on the stock throughout the whole cut. Personally, I only do about half of the edge of the tool at a time just because it increases control for me. Now to determine the thickness that I need to make the tenon, I use a set of calipers and I set them for the outside of the ferrule. I know in advance that this is too big, but this is more of a safety margin. You can always take off wood. It's a little bit harder to put it back on. Once you get the tenon to the thickness of your calipers, it's time to undercut the base a little bit. This is there so that if you, ever, if you do scrape wood as you're putting the ferrule on, it will release on bottom. It also gives it a nicer look whenever it seats. The other thing I do is I kind of put a small V cut uh, at the tailstock so that way the bit whenever we do drill the hole will have a place to rest and you need to put a chamfer on the tenon. This is for that round portion of the ferrule. If you're just using bra uh, copper piping you don't need to do that. Now when the tenon looks good to you, meaning it's about the length of the ferrule, you've got a slight undercut on bottom, the tip is chamfered a little bit, and it fits your calipers okay, it's time to go ahead and take the blank off the lathe and test out the ferrule fit. You know in advance this first time it's going to be too big because the calipers were set to the outside of the ferrule, not the inside. 
but a couple times it just fits for some reason. You, you messed up and made it too thin. So it's better safe than sorry to go ahead and test it just to be sure. You can then put the stock back on the lathe. Just line up the center holes with your uh, drive, uh, drive and the uh, tail stock. It'll fit fine. It'll still be centered. If it's off a little bit, no big deal. Now use a scraping cut to make the final fit. It doesn't take off wood very fast. It leaves a little bit rough and it doesn't look great, but that's okay. It's gonna be hidden underneath the underneath the ferrule. When you're making the scraper cut, be sure to approach the wood at 90 degrees because there's a bevel there. That bevel is pointing down. And then once the bevel is touching, it's probably not gonna start cutting. You just need to raise it up a little bit until you start getting shavings off. And that's a perfect scraping angle. It's going to take a couple trial fittings to get the ferrule on just right. It's right when you can push it on by hand about halfway. Uh, at this point, I just grabbed a, a scrap piece of wood, put the ferrule down on it, and using a rubber mallet, just pounded it on. Now, this is where the thin brass ferrules I purchased can deform a little bit and why I wasn't a big fan of them. When you use copper piping, it's thick enough that you can really hammer on it and they aren't going to bend at all. Plus you can sharpen the end that's going on and it will scrape its way down the tenon making a perfect fit. That's also why you undercut the very base because that scraping action will release and you can get those shavings out so it'll look really nice and it'll be seated well. After it's seated, simply put it back on the lathe for shaping. Now on about half of my screwdrivers, I drilled the hole at this point by putting the Jacob's chuck in the tailstock. The resulting hole was still small enough that I could put the live center into it to finish the shaping. On this particular example, I waited to the end to drill, drill the hole. To come up with the design, I simply used a screwdriver I already had that I liked as a template. This allowed me to lay out proportions for all my screwdrivers roughly the same, uh, simply with a pencil mark. Now, I first wasted away about half the material you know, at the tail. Be sure not to waste away too much since this is the drive side. If you take away too much, it will become weak and the piece will actually twist off as you add friction from your uh, skew chisel on the nose of the screwdriver. Notice in the shearing cut, I'm using the bottom of the tool as a fence. Because the bevel is cut at 45 degrees, when that 45 degrees is flat against the piece, the stock, that means the bottom of the tool is at 45 degrees. So I can ride the bevel of the tool to make the cut and ride the bottom to control the angle it goes in. So I end up with a perfect 45 degrees at the base. At this time, I also round the tail section. That, that way, when I add the taper in the next step, I'm gonna have a very clean transition line from the gradual taper to the curving of the tail. I also use that transition point from the taper to the round of the tail as my target width for my finger guard in the front. So once I have that width, I come to the front and using a shear cut, I kind of eyeball it down to that level. I can then use a scraping cut, again, approaching from the, the center point forward and raising up until I get a cutting action. And then using an arcing, arching motion, I will cut out the cove for my fingers. Now, because this is a scraping cut, I can go uphill in the cut. If I were using a planing cut or a slicing cut, that would be kind of stupid. Don't worry about the rough finish the scraping cut leaves because you'll refine it with sand sandpaper. Then using alternating between V cuts, beading cuts, and the scraper, I will define the shape of the finger guard. You just go back and forth between all three of these to blend them all together. Lastly is sanding and finishing. Before you start sanding though, move that rest out of the way. You don't want it anywhere near the lathe at this time. And when you sand on a lathe that can't reverse like this one is, can't, 
uh, always sand from the underside. That way, if the sandpaper or cloth or anything you are holding catches, it will be thrown away from you. And you never want to wrap anything around it because that will just wrap around and you can uh, pull your fingers into it, which isn't a good idea. Uh, I hold the sandpaper kind of loosely and occasionally it just flings out of my fingers. No danger, stuff like that, because I don't have a lot of pressure on it. It's not that big a deal. With sanding, just work your way through the grits. Spend most of your time with the roughest one because this will allow you some final shaping ability. The trick to a nice surface is to keep the sandpaper moving and stay at it until all the lines from the previous grit have disappeared. The final step is burnishing the wood and I like this process because it goes from what you think the sandpaper is nice and smooth to almost a glass smooth finish. Simply turn the lathe off, gather up a handful of the shavings, put it underneath it and squeeze a little bit. Then turn the lathe back on, obviously at a slow speed. Then move your hand back, back and forth. The shavings will start flying out of your hand. So you don't, you're not going to do this but for five or six seconds. Uh, you never want to risk having no shavings in your hand because that might burn it a little bit. It's kind of a cool effect. Finishing is really up to you. For tool handles like this, I simply use beeswax. Put a liberal coat of it straight off the block and then using some scrap cotton t-shirt material or something like that. I fold it over so I can get a good solid feel to it. And doing the same method as with sanding, coming up underneath, only holding on tight with your front hand so that it'll, uh, if it comes out, it'll just fling forward. Uh, put a little pressure and actually melt the wax into the wood with a little friction. I think this is kind of cool because you can watch the wood change color. That's one of the cool aspects of uh, working on the lathe. It happens so fast. Next, simply separate the end, end scrap off the screwdriver. You can use a V-cut or you can actually take it off and use a handsaw. You're going to have to finish sand the base of it uh, off the lathe and finish it. A little buffing wheel works great for that. Now to drill the hole for the screwdriver shanks. I put blue tape at the, on the end of the screwdriver to protect it because you'll be seeing it into that round tail stock. Place your Jacob's chuck and bit into the drive, then position the tail stock so that you can rest the screwdriver on the bit and tail stock. I use my hand to hold and center the tail of the screwdriver on the tail stock. Then I reach around, turn the lathe on, and slowly screw the tail stock in so it pushes the screwdriver onto the drill bit. After about an inch, if you want to, you can simply grip the screwdriver and push it the rest of the way on. But just be sure you don't slip. I simply just kept screwing it in until the desired depth. The final thing to do is put the shank of the screwdriver into the screwdriver handle. Simply position it in the hole. Now, there are wings on it. You want to make sure those wings are not going with the grain. Even though there's a ferrule on it, there's still a chance that you could split the wood. Make sure the wings are kind of cross-cutting the grain. I would then simply put the tip on a piece of scrap wood and with a rubber mallet, bang it on a few times. Uh, occasionally, you might want to check to make sure it's going in straight, but since there's only one hole, it should be just fine. Some people I've read put a drop or two of super glue in the hole before they uh, seat the shank. I really haven't had any problems with mine. I don't think it's necessary. That's it. One screwdriver down, 17 more to go. This little project was quick, cheap, and in the end, I'm a lot more comfortable with the skew chisel, which was the whole goal of the practicing. So one more time in fast forward. See if you can catch all my mistakes.
Thanks for watching my video. If you enjoyed it, please subscribe and tell your friends. And remember, it's always worth the effort to learn, create, and share with others. Y'all be safe and have fun.